Hello and welcome to your THB online community. I'm Dallas, your online community pastor. Today, we're going to be continuing our series, Reclaim, by asking another thought-provoking question. Today, our lead pastor, Scott Etheridge, is asking you the question, how is your freedom? We hope that this message not only encourages you, but challenges you. We firmly believe that the things that are spoken here on Sundays and Wednesdays are not just for those who are able to join us, but also for members of our THP online community. That being said, if this message does challenge you, if you are encouraged by it, we want to hear from you. Feel free to email us at mediahub at thpshreport.com, or you can reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just look for THP Shreveport. Galatians, we'll be there in just a moment, but Galatians chapter 5, and if you got a bulletin card this morning, if you'll flip that over, you'll see you got some space for some notes, and it has scriptures on there. Uh, there is one typo in our notes, it's not Galatians 5.13, it's Galatians 5.1, uh, so if you'll just keep that in mind, Galatians 5.1, it's kind of the crux of where we're going to be today. Um, it's not necessarily where we're going to start off, but really what we're talking about today is going to be centered around that. And as I said last week, um, you know, there's only, only so much time we have together. And um, so as we're, as we're reading the different scriptures, I have several different scriptures we're going to read today. You know, I want to make sure that uh, in order to get the totality of what God is not just saying in this, this time together, but what God is saying to you through this time. See, it's not just about getting a message and like going through the motions of this thing. How many of you know that God has something he wants to say to you today? Not just us, but God has something he wants to say to you today. God wants to give you something today that you can then turn around and use for your benefit and for his glory. And so uh, Galatians 5, I would encourage you this next week to read the totality of that. Read the, read the context of that because there's a lot that, Paul is saying in that, there's a lot that's going on in that that we just do not have the time to completely go through today. But I want you to just uh, cover that. So over the past year, you have kind of heard the following terminology. You've heard the path, you've heard fruitful living, you've heard next steps, you've heard discover, grow, moments, movement, pioneer, reclaim. You have heard all this terminology throughout this year. In the past couple of weeks, we have been talking about this, this thought of reclaim, reclaiming that which has been lost. And so we really dug into this, this reclaiming. And if you've been with us, you just sense it. God is moving. God is opening up new opportunities for us. If you don't know that, then you need to get in the stream. You need to not be on the hilltop looking down at the river. You need to get down into the river because the water's just fine. Sometimes when God starts moving, we head to the hills and we become spectators, but God has called all of us to get in the river. Yes. If you're standing on the banks of the river, how many of you know that God wants you to get in the river? Yes. God wants you to get into what he is doing and what he is saying and there are new opportunities and there is new ground that, that God is preparing for us and, and we have been going back and we've been reclaiming some things that have been lost because sometimes we just lose stuff, amen? Amen. Not that it gets stolen, but sometimes we just lose things. We've asked the question, how many times have you lost your keys? Go ahead and raise your hand if you've ever lost your keys. How many of you thought you needed a defibrillator when you did lose your keys? Come on, anybody here, right? Have you ever lost anything? Well, when you lose something, what happens? When you realize you lose it, there's almost a panic that sets in. Especially if it's like a, a debit card or a credit card or your phone or whatever it is. There's almost like an anxiety that comes my whole life. I've lost my whole life. I've, I've lost my, my entire being is gone. Someone else has it. But how many of you know that that's the same for humanity and our soul? When God sees a lost one who's off somewhere and he goes to seek and save it. There is something inside of him. It's not panic or anxiety, but it's love. And what he wants to do is he wants to go to that lost one and he wants to reclaim them. And he wants to bring them back and he wants to put them in the body, in the fold, and then he wants to make the lost one better than they ever were before. Aren't you glad 
that when you allow God to come in, he will make it better than it's ever been. And that's the whole point of reclaim. And we've used all the different scenarios for that, homes and cars. And we talked about the fact of old cars. You know, for me, it's old trucks. So wherever we go, I'm always on the lookout. I'm looking for barns. I'm looking for gas station signs on barns. I'm looking behind barns. I'm looking where there's high grass. And every time I see like a first generation Dodge truck with grass about this high just deteriorate, I'm going, what are they doing? What are they doing? It's just gonna rot. I could do something with that. I could get that truck. I could re claim it and it would be better than it was before and it will be more valuable than it ever was before. How many of you know that's the way that we need to be about people? Sometimes we see people in the high grass just deteriorating and we don't think, man, how can I go and how can I help them reclaim? How can, I, how can God move through me to help reclaim that person? Sometimes we just think, well, you know, they're just this or they're just that or they're just this. Let me tell you something. Here's one of the takeaways from Thursday morning when I told that story about the little boy. I said in October 9th, 1968, there was a little boy born in Benton Harbor, Michigan, and I went through the whole scenario, the whole thing. Never gave them a hint. It was me. I was just talking about a little boy. That's all I was talking about. But by the time we got to the end of it, I said, that boy was me and that little baby that was born that awakened that man's eyes is sitting right over there and her name is Sierra. And so because of a teacher's influence in my life and because of a transformation that took place, that teacher is now at this school, educating and teaching. See, that's how God sees us. God doesn't just see, well, there's this and there's this and this person is this and this person is that. So many times we're too busy speaking to people as we see them rather than what God says about them. How do you want me to talk about you in front of people? Let me ask you that question today. If I know certain things about your life, you don't want everybody to know. If I've sat with you across the table and, and, and whatever it is, how do you want me to walk into a room and speak about you or speak about this person or speak about this person? And we all get so caught up in all that and even I can get so caught up in that that I forget that God wants to reclaim all that stuff and a lot of those things that I would think in my mind are actually lies that the enemy has spoken. But what does God say? And that's what reclaim is all about. It's not just reclaiming a piece of wood or a car or a house. It's reclaiming an identity. Things get lost and they get stolen, they get misplaced and things you had victory over and had authority over, they get lost along the way. And John 10, 10 lays it out so clear for us. Jesus tells us that Satan, he has not come to make your life better. He's not come to make your life more fun. He's not come to, to make everything okay. He has come to steal, to kill and destroy. And we have an enemy and he wants to destroy everything in your life. But the resurrected Jesus in Matthew 28, 18 says this, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And if Jesus has all the authority, Satan has none. So what does that mean? Well, that means the best that he can do is be a squatter in your life. That's the best he can do is be a squatter in your life. He shows up in an area where you have had authority and he tries to intimidate you and deceive you, but it's time in Jesus' name that we say, hey, squatter, by the way, get off my property because you don't belong here. Some of us have invited him in to squat on our property and said, hey, it's okay if you just hang around. But in Jesus' name, it's time to say, no, 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 no. No squatting on my property. This belongs to the Lord and I belong to the Lord. Amen? If Jesus has all authority, it means there is nothing in your life that is beyond the point of being able to be reclaimed. And I can tell you right now, for some of you, that's all you needed to hear today. There is nothing in your life, there is nothing in your marriage, there is nothing in your friendships, there is nothing in your heart, nothing in your mind, nothing in your children, nothing in your destiny. There is nothing in your life beyond the ability to be reclaimed in Jesus' name. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of reclamation. Like that's what the kingdom is all about, reclaiming. God seeks and saves that which is lost. Some of you will get this, some of you won't. So pay close attention. 
he goes to the island of misfit toys. And he says, come, all you who are weary and burdened down, and I will give you rest. I will reclaim you, and I will make you better than you ever were before. I'm so thankful that bruised and battered on that island by myself, thinking that I wasn't valuable for anyone or anything, that God came to that island, and he said, come on, Scott. Come on, come! I know you're weary. I know you're burdened down, but it's time to allow me to reclaim you and I'm gonna make you better than you ever were before. Let me tell you something, you are not a mistake. Come on, somebody hear me today? You are not a mistake. If you were born, guess what? God has a plan. <laughs> if you were born, God has a plan. And when God reclaims the lost thing, he doesn't just reclaim it, he blesses it and he makes it even better than it was before. The first thing that was ever lost that needed to be reclaimed was us. Adam in the garden, everything got broken, right? And God decided he was gonna reclaim it. And when God reclaimed us, he made us even better because Adam walked with God, but today in Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in us. Listen, I'm thankful that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father ever interceding for us, but I'm also thankful that it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. What does that mean? That means Jesus is at the right hand of the Father ever interceding, but guess what? He is also in me because it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Hmm. When God reclaimed us, he continued to make us better and better and better. Because when you go and reclaim it, he can give you more than you lost in Jesus' name. But in all honesty, listen, you have to straight up humble yourself and say, you know what? I've lost some ground, but I'm gonna go back and get it in Jesus' name. And that's what this series is all about, everybody. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith Test yourselves. What does he mean? Well, sometimes you just got to stop and check yourself. How many of you know we can just keep going and going and going and going? And we can ignore all the dashboard lights going off, right? Check oil, check engine. Boom, boom. No, I'm going to just keep on going. It's fine. I'm going to go. I had a mechanic telling me about he works at a super high-end garage, right? And he said there was somebody who had bought a $175,000 Land Rover. They brought it in. It had 31,000 miles on it, and they had never changed the oil. Every time they got a card from the, from the garage, hey, it's time to change it, they just ignored it. So they kept driving it and kept driving it and kept driving it. Well, after a while, the piston twisted so much and brought forth so much pressure that it shot out the side of the block through the fender well. And they said, I don't know what happened. <laughs> so they started asking questions. Well, did you do this and did you do this? Oh, no, we didn't think it was important. I mean, we paid $175,000 for it. We just kind of thought it was going to happen. Like it changes its own oil or something, Right? <laughs> But the mechanics were like this. We've never seen anything like this. Let's take this thing apart. We want to see why. We want to see how. How many of you know that's what God does for us? We are broken, and he says, wait a second. No, 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 no. I don't want to just cosmetically, I don't want to just give him a new car. Let me take this thing apart. Let me expose it all. Let me find out where it started. Come on, right? And that means we've got to get to the place where we allow God to get in there, but we have to say, Paul, Paul said it to the church at Corinth, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Sometimes you just got to check yourself and say, have I lost ground? And if you have, then do something. Go back and get it in Jesus' name. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And if you've never read Galatians and don't know the, the backstory of Galatians, you need to read Galatians. Man, Paul has so much to say in Galatians. Galatians chapter five, verse one. Stand fast, therefore, 
in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. What does that mean? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That we don't have to go back Why? Because he defeated sin. He defeated death. He defeated the grave. And if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. But I'm going to tell you today, there's a big difference between being set free and living set free. Christ has set you free. Now live it. He said the same thing about the Holy Spirit. He not only said walk in the Spirit, but live in the Spirit. Both. Remember the Israelites, 400 years of Egyptian bondage, right? That's all they knew for generations. Bondage, 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 bondage. It's never gonna be any different. It's never gonna change. It's never gonna sound familiar to anybody. My dad did this, my grandpa did this, my great-great-grandpa did this, this happened, this person around me did this, this. It's never gonna change, it's always gonna be the same. But then God sets them free and he brings them across the Red Sea and they are as free as they have ever been. Within a few days, guess what happens? Hardship comes. And what's the first thing they do? I'm free. No. They want to go back. Hardship comes. Well, wait a second. God set us free. God took us to the other side. Surely that means that everything's going to be fine now and I'm never going to have to go through anything. When you say, Jesus, I will follow you. I repent. I turn from my wicked ways. I'm going to follow you. Guess what? The road ahead is good, but there are mountains. And with mountains, you know that there are giants, right? And those giants will come against, not your gifts, but the giants will come against your identity to see if really you are standing fast, therefore, in the liberty of Christ, that Christ has set you free. Do you really know who you are? A few days of freedom, a few obstacles, and they want to re-enslave themselves. They were set free, but they had no idea how to live free. And it's amazing how quickly we want to go back to the comfort of bondage rather than press on to the unknown of freedom. Do not be bound up with the yoke again. Come on, Jesus set us free. You do not need a stinking yoke. Who else needs another weight on top of you? Nobody. You don't need no stinking yoke. Jesus said, I've given you you one, but it is easy. And my burden is light. Why? Because he carries it when we give it to him. So you know what's coming. If you've been here for the last few weeks, you know what's coming. You know what I'm going to ask between you and God. How's your freedom? Right? People have been asking me, why are you asking us questions? Because Jesus did. Right? If you read the life of Jesus, he asks a lot of questions. They want him to give them just, give me the answer. And Jesus asks them a question. What is he doing? He's creating curiosity. Why? Because he wants them to seek. He wants them to ask, seek, and knock. And then they will get the answer. We want this microwave answer. Just give me the answer. Do you know how many answers that I have given people that they have not done? So here's what I figured. Why don't I just ask them some questions because I'd rather them be frustrated than me be frustrated by them not doing what I said to do. Because when I sit with somebody, I'm not telling them what to do. I'm taking them to the word of God. Here's what the word of God says. Well, you know, no, here's what the word of God says. Well, you know, maybe I could, this is what the word of God says. Like that, that's the roadmap. How's your freedom? Be honest. Zero to 10. Bondage, living free. Completely free. Where are you at? How's your freedom? We asked last week, how's your hope? Like, where's your hope at? This week, where's your freedom? Just be honest. Why? Because honesty is the beginning of breakthrough. 
Are you full of faith, hope, and love, and growing in God, and taking your next steps in the Lord, and flourishing, and, and bearing fruit? Or are you living in bondage, and anxiety, and depression, and sin? But here's the good news. Wherever you are, maybe not where you want to be, but it's not where you have to stay. I'm going to take freedom back in Jesus' name. Freedom is a word that we use sometimes loosely in America. And that word kind of gets lost in all that. And we forget freedom in Christ is paramount. Come on, somebody say amen. It's the kingdom. I'm thankful for the freedom of our nation. I believe in it so much I put my name on the line and said, whatever that means, I'll do it. That's how much I believe in the freedom of this country. But there came a day that was more important than that. And it was the day that I handed over and said, I'm not gonna sign it. I'm just gonna give my life to you and you go ahead and you write my name in the book. Come on, somebody, right? See, that's the kind of freedom that we're talking about today. Be who God created you to be. Know what God is doing. Do what God said. That's freedom, a restored identity, a reconciled relationship with God, a redeemed purpose. The gospel is freedom. Well, what is the gospel? The finished work of Jesus. Not just for eternal life someday, but for right now. Do you know the gospel is powerful enough and good enough for right now, not just for what will be? Too many people are thinking that the gospel is just for some day to come rather than this day right now. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is foolishness to those who are perishing. You say, you know what? I just don't get why the pe- I tell people about Jesus and I tell them about the gospel. And I tell them, they just, they just like, no, 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 no way. There wasn't some dude 2,000 years ago who died for me and did this and this. Listen, why are you surprised by that? It is foolishness to those that are perishing. But to us, it is the power of God. To us, it says the gospel is foolish to those who are in bondage. Those who are in bondage look at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as foolish. But those who are being saved, it is the freedom of God. For those of us who are being saved, sozo, save, heal, make whole. I am being saved. I am being set free. I am being made whole. And one day I will be just like him. One day I will never get another phone call to say, Scott, can you pray for my grandmother? She has cancer. Scott, can you pray for my aunt? Can you pray for my mother? She has dementia. Can you pray for my father? Can you pray for my sister? Scott, can you come to the hospital? I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. They won't tell me, but it's bad. Well, guess what? In that day, there'll be no more phone calls like that because there'll be no death There'll be no cancer. There'll be no AIDS. Come on, there'll be no sickness. There'll be no disease. There'll be no disappointment. There'll be no offense. There'll be no bitterness. There'll be no more tears, no more weeping. Paul writes to the Galatian church. And listen, the the church at Galatia is not terrible. It's not horrible. But they had been set free, but not truly living free. And he tells them in another portion of of Galatians, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. He's like, something got in the way. Somebody got in your race and got in the way. Somebody diverted you away from the truth. What happened to you? Listen, if we trust God for eternal life someday, Why don't we trust him for freedom today? If the gospel is good enough for the destiny of our soul, why is it not good enough for my addiction, my anxiety, my fear, my worry, my depression? Come on. Has it become foolish to you? It's Jesus that sets you free and empowers you to live free, and it starts by receiving his grace. Everybody say grace. Just want to make sure you all still had a voice. It just encourages me every once in a while just to hear something. Grace not only forgives, but listen to me. It completely transforms us, restores our identity, 
Adam broke our identity. Through one man, it got lost. But through the one man, Jesus, many will be made righteous. We are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, not because of what we do, but because of what he has done. Right? We are righteous not because we live righteously. We live righteously because we are now righteous in Jesus. We are not just sinners saved by grace. We are not just sinners saved by grace. We are not just sinners saved by grace. We are beloved sons and daughters. We're not just sinners saved by grace. We are sons and daughters. We are not sinners saved by grace. Just alone, we are sons and daughters. And if I'm a beloved son, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna spend my life building my father's kingdom instead of my own. But if I resist his grace, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna try to avoid his presence and I'm gonna spend my life building my own kingdom. And if I don't know who I am, I don't know who he is and I don't know what I'm created to do. If I believe I'm a spiritual orphan, I will be afraid of the father. And guess what? I will spend my life trying to do a bunch of things to take care of myself. That's an exhausting way to live, guys. So if I'm not free, then I've lost some ground with the gospel. Have you lost some ground in your relationship with God, feeling like there's a distance, like he's mad at you, like he's just so mad at you all the time? Have you become insecure, isolated, or selfish? And listen to me. Are you having a hard time giving grace to other people in your life? Because if I can't give grace, it's because I'm not receiving grace. And that's a problem. When I'm walking with God, listen, when you're walking with God, your relationships should be healthier. Your view of God should not be based on your friendships or your family. Your view of your family and friendships should be based on your knowledge of God. This right here should dictate this right here. But too many people are allowing this here to dictate that. Well, my dad was this and he was angry and he was this. So that means God is a hateful father waiting to beat me down. Or my mother was this or my sister was this or my brother was this. And all of a sudden we push that up to God as if it's his fault. But when we have this right, all this becomes healthier. Because now we're not just looking at, oh, well, this is wrong with them and this is wrong with them and this is wrong with them. Now we understand, you know what? The gospel's foolishness to them. Why am I surprised by that? So what do I need to do? I need to live free. Why? So that they will know what freedom in Christ looks like. Again, you can say it all you want, but there's a whole world who's waiting for what you're saying to line up with what's actually happening in your life. What you're doing to line up with what you're saying and vice versa. Listen, the freest place to be is when you're releasing the Father's kingdom, not building your own. And if you're sitting here and you're like, you know what, did I come to church today to hear about this again? Yes, you did. Free people love to be reminded of their freedom. You're either reigning in Jesus' name, walking in victory, or everything else is reigning over you. It's one or the other, and sometimes you just gotta stop. You gotta stand up and step in. Anxiety, worry, depression, fear, temptation, pornography, brokenness, no. I am set free. You do not reign over me. Thank you, God, I am free. Thank you, God, that you set me free. Lord, I need your grace because I'm not living free. I know if I'm set free, then I can live free in you. Don't let yourselves go back to bondage. What did Paul tell them? Don't allow yourself to go back in bondage. You've been set free in Christ. You've been set free. So you don't have to go back again to the yoke of bondage. Don't look at what you want to be free from. Look at the one who has set you free. Stop focusing on anxiety and fear and worry and doubt and whatever bondage in your life. Stop giving it authority and look to the one who set you free because it's not about what you do, it's about what Jesus has done. In John chapter one, verse 17, the word says, for the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. 
He brought both. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. And it's grace that leads me to truth, and it's truth that sets me free. So if I'm not free, that must mean I'm believing a lie. And if I'm believing a lie, guess what? I need grace to expose it in Jesus' name to lead me to truth. It's like when someone says something about you, an identity statement, an attack. Any of you ever been called the name? Raise your hand. Anybody been called the name? If you have never been called the name, I need you to counsel me once. I need to know how you're living. If you've never been called the name. Somebody says something about you and it's an identity statement. It's not just thrown off the cuff, but it goes to the core of who you are. It's derogatory about who you are. It was a lie, but it got in your mind, and then it got in your heart, and now you don't want to talk about it. You hold it in, and guess what? You start to believe it. Then you remember this. God is good. Jesus has forgiven me. I am loved, and all things are possible for them that believe. So does what that person said about you line up with that? No. Well, what is that? It's a lie. And in Jesus' name, I remove it and I replace it with God is good. Jesus has forgiven me. I am loved and all things are possible for them that believe. That's freedom. <laughs> has stuff gotten into your heart and your mind that doesn't line up with the word of God? Guess what? It's a lie. Satan is only a squatter. Listen, if that's the only thing you get out of today, great. Great. Satan is just a squatter. But if he's squatting on your property right now, you've given him squatter rights. And that means the gospel in some way in our life has become foolish because we believed a lie. The enemy wants to deceive you into thinking that he owns the rights to your life and he's empowered through our agreement, but he's defeated in Jesus' name. Listen, when you believe a lie, you empower the lie, and you empower the liar, and you give them authority and a right to stay. Again, why do you trust the gospel for eternal life someday, but not freedom today? Why do you trust the gospel for eternal life someday, but not freedom for today? Like it's, it's the gospel is for right now. You're here today and you're hurting. The gospel's for right now. Yeah. Not just someday when it won't hurt anymore. Guess what? When it doesn't hurt anymore, you'll have no need for tongues. You'll have no need for any of those other things. Yeah. Why? Because you're going to know all things. Yeah. You need it today. Yeah. You need the gospel today. Yeah. Come on, amen. Yeah. We're thinking about a time when we won't even need any of that. We need it now. I don't want to just trust the destiny of my soul to the gospel, but any kind of behavior pattern. Romans chapter one, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. I am not ashamed. So if you've lost some ground, if you've lost some freedom, how do you get it back? Well, the same way you got it in the first place. <laughs> Confession and repentance. Jesus, I'm a savior and I am in need of a, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I am in need of a savior. Would you please come and reclaim me? Or maybe it's simply today, Jesus, I'm a beloved son or daughter, but I'm not living free right now. Would you please come and help me reclaim my freedom? Why don't you just ask him? When's the last time you were completely, absolutely, completely honest with him? Like, Jesus, I'm in bondage. Can you help me? I surrender. I need you. Jesus shares a story in Matthew chapter 18 about a shepherd that has 100 sheep. And I know that this passage has been twisted and taken to mean something that it wasn't necessarily intended to mean. 
A lot of leaders have taken this and kind of put themselves in that shepherd's place and said, well, you know, I leave the 99 to get the one. Jesus really wasn't referring to us. He was referring to himself in that passage. That's what he's like. What does he do? Well, there's 100. They're in a green pasture, place of freedom, protection, and one sheep wanders off and gets lost. The shepherd leaves the 99 and pursues the one, and he seeks to save that which was lost. And when he gets to the lost sheep, he wants to reclaim it, but the sheep has to allow him. You guys hear that? The sheep have to allow him. And that sheep has to stop running, and that sheep has to stop wandering, and that sheep has to stop fighting, stop hiding, and it needs to surrender. And when that happens, what does he do? He picks it up, he puts it on his shoulders, he reclaims it, he blesses it, and now there is a different level of intimacy that the sheep and the shepherd now have in the process of restoration. Why? Because the sheep now knows that the shepherd's gonna leave it all to go get him. And when, Je- and when Jesus takes us and he wraps us up and he's bringing us back, there's a level of intimacy that takes place in that reclaiming. So let this good shepherd come and reclaim you today. Listen, I'm not the good shepherd. I've taken some heat for that from other pastors. You are the shepherd. You're the shepherd. You're the shepherd. You're the shepherd. Psalm 23 is not about me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. If you've made somebody your it, you're always gonna be in want. But if the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. Doesn't mean that I'm not a leader or I don't have responsibilities. It simply means that Jesus is the good shepherd. He leaves the 99 to get the one. Wait a second, Scott, that's your job. (laughs) Really? Well, the Bible says that his sheep know his voice, right? Which means that I'm one of the sheep, right? The rod and the staff isn't from me, but it's from him. When you run away from God, Scott's not chasing you down to hit you with a rod. It's, that's not it. Doesn't mean that I won't call and check on you or something like that. And if you're running, you probably don't want me to do that anyway, to be quite honest. You're gonna get mad at me anyway. If I call or I don't call, you're gonna be mad. If I call, I'm overbearing. If I don't call, I don't care. But I can tell you this, wherever you're running to hide, Jesus is already there once you stop because he's everywhere. His presence is everywhere. Like he's already there. And the Holy Spirit is gonna be there that when you get there to that hiding, the Holy Spirit's gonna be there to remind you, what are you doing here? Like, what, what are you doing here? Why are you hiding? Get out, get out of there. Come on, get back in. Jesus came in to seek that which was lost and that's the gospel. It is the power of God for all who would believe to be set free and live free in Jesus' name. So what's the Holy Spirit saying to you in this moment? If you're here and you say, you know what? I want more freedom in my life, Scott. I want more freedom. I invite you to stand up by faith right now. Right now. Don't wait for anything. We're gonna pray for all the staff and kids. But if you're here and you say, I want more freedom in my life, stand up right now. I need more freedom in my life. Stand up. You're standing up by faith. You're saying, I'm, I'm just being transparent with you, Lord. Somewhere along the way, I've lost some ground and I want to reclaim it today in Jesus' name. Somewhere along the path, I don't know what happened, but just is not everything that it needs to be. 
I want more freedom in my life. I'm reclaiming freedom today in Jesus' name. And here's what we're saying today. In Jesus' name, we say anxiety, you must go. In Jesus' name, we say fear, you must go. If I call something out that you're dealing with, just lift your hands toward heaven and just begin to reclaim freedom in that area. In Jesus' name, we say anxiety, you gotta go. In Jesus' name, we say fear, you have to go. In Jesus' name, we say worry, depression, addiction, you must go. In Jesus' name, we say sickness and brokenness and darkness, you must go. In Jesus' name, we say schizophrenia, schizophrenia and bipolar activity, things in our minds that get us lost, we say you must go. In Jesus' name, we say shame, condemnation, guilt, you must go. In Jesus' name, we say the squatter of darkness, you have no right, no authority in my life, you have to go. Because in Jesus' name, by grace, I have been set free. And in Jesus' name, I will allow the Holy Spirit full access to help me live free. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this message from our series, Reclaim. We hope that this message really did encourage you and and maybe drew some things out of you. If you'd like for us to pray with you, feel free to contact us via any of our social media. We're at THP Shreveport on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter. You can also visit us at thpshreveport.com or you can email us at mediahub at thpshreveport.com. We give you all these options because we want to connect with you, because we want to pray with you, because we want to encourage you, because you are part of our THP online community.